Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Religious Liberties Day for 2020. It has been a momentous year, and we're here to give you some of the key things which have taken place to try and answer some of your questions. And we're here to share that uh, we are living in extraordinary times. Today, the day will take place as follows. We will start with a, a panel, a panel discussion. After that, we'll have a documentary. We'll then have a special item and we will conclude with a sermon. We really hope that you'll be blessed by what you hear and we pray that you'll try your best to take part as well. We don't have all the answers, but we are trying our best to pull together whatever we can to support you. We really hope that you will learn lots today. and You'll actually give us your input as well. We'll have our details at the end. We are part of ARLAC, which stands for Religious Liberties Adventist Advisory Council, and we sit with the NEC. And we pray you'll be blessed and have a safe, prosperous and peaceful New Year. Thank you and bye bye. Welcome to our Religious Liberties Advisory Council panel. Um, my name is Linda Augustine. I am the Secretary of the Religious Liberties Advisory Council Committee. And let, I'd like to take this time to introduce you to our panel today. Let me start with Paul Monroe. Hi, um, as Dennis just said, my name is Paul Monroe. I'm a religious liberty leader in my local church in Wolverhampton. It's a pleasure to be here with you all today. Thank you. Mitchell? Jackie? Sorry, didn't hear that properly. Hi, Jackie Pickle. I'm the, the religious, uh, religious liberties lead for the Manchester South Church. Thanks, Jackie. Clem Morgan. Hi, my name's Clem Morgan. I'm the Religious Liberty Leader at Camp Hill Seventh-day Adventist Church in Birmingham. LaSalle Gordon. Hello, I'm LaSalle Gordon and I assist uh, Elder Clem at Camp Hill Church. Thank you. And last but by no, thank you, uh, LaSalle. And last but by no means least, Adrian Roberts. Oh, hi, I'm Adrian, Adrian Roberts. I'm the uh, chairperson for the Religious Liberty Group here, ARLAC, um, <clears throat> uh, which uh, is an acronym for Religious Liberty Adventist Advisory Council. Uh, a couple of years ago, Pastor Jackson uh, decided to uh, remove this traditionally from the, the idea of religious liberty from the, po the position of being part of what the president does and pass it to the people uh, so that we could actually um, look at it in more detail and his hands were freed um, and so we decided to get a group of people from different churches who in the north in the north conference who were interested in the subject uh, quite passionately and uh, we came together and decided there are nine of us in all that uh, what needs to be done is for us to have a look at how the events in the world affect the issue of religious liberty and what it means to help advise people, members within the church regarding their employment issues or anything like that, where there's a, an issue of faith, um, but also to encourage every church to have a religious li liberty leader in the church and for everyone to be focused on this because it's something that is and will affect us in the future. Um, Adventists and Christians outside of that and we have a, a fundamental belief in everyone's freedom to believe as they want to. Thank you very much for that Adrian. So what we're going to do now is just go into a series of questions and um, our panel will be responding to them as we go through. Now Linda, interesting... Linda we, we're going to pray first. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Let us pray. Let's close our eyes. Father in heaven, we come here to you today to highlight the world's conditions that you have said in the Bible. And Lord, we want to share your word clearly with the people of the world as you've commissioned us. Give each one of us wisdom, as always, as we go through the topics that we'll be speaking about today. This is your work, so bless us as we share your word regarding liberty. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. So the video that showed before we started this panel discussion looks at climate change 
Uh, Quinn, can you start us off? Climate change, how is it affecting the world economy? Well, it, it, it's a very difficult one to answer, but let me, let me have, a, have a go. Well, climate change is really affecting us because we've got lots of floods, uh, fires, um, snowstorms. A lot of people don't think about snowstorms that we're having across the world. And it's affecting the economy great. Let me just deal with the United Kingdom as we're here, because that's where we are in, mm -hmm. in the north. Um, some of our insurance companies, uh, Glenda, are refusing now to insure certain areas of England and Britain. So because the, the, the claims are so vast, um, Britain so far this year, uh, with all the floods and all the disasters with the climate change, it's mm -hmm. cost us 280 billion pounds. That's wow. an astronomical sum of money. So when we look at the world, we can look at the United States, it's cost them to date this year only $16 trillion just with climate change. So it is having a massive effect on the world. And if I can just finally add one thing. Yeah. The floods that we've had, we don't think of the impact that it has. It's left mm -hmm. sewage four feet high and yeah. with the water and on our arable lands where we grow our foods, that's four yeah. feet high of sewage and water, where they're now saying to us, they cannot grow any crops on there for six months. So that means our price of our food's going up. So yes, it's just on a little doorstep, it's affecting us and the world. Right. So what's the link then between climate change and religious liberties? Because this is a religious liberties platform. What do we think the link is between climate change and religious liberties? A very good question. The link is where the Pope now, I'm, I'm going to talk about the Vatican, he's saying, well, look, there's a link here that um, we need to take care of our world. Now, it's not the Pope that's saying it. Let's get this right. God gave us custodians in, in Genesis to look after the world. So we are supposed to be doing what the Pope is saying. But the reason behind it, um, Glenda, is that the Pope is now saying, ah, um, Lado Sai, Ladato Sai, I think Lado it's called. Sai, yeah. yeah, it urges 1.2 billion Catholics now to look for a day to rest the earth. So that's the problem with climate change. We've got this young lady called the Swedish lady, environmentalist Greta Thunberg. Mm -hmm. And what she's doing on the Pope's bidding is trying to get a day of rest. Now, right. if you look at Genesis, Genesis chapter 2, verse 1 and 3 tells us that. But if you want to skip to Exodus 20, Exodus 20 will tell us that remember. That's what we're told. So when we're told to remember, remember means something happened in the past. So God has already given us a rest day. So the Vatican now is trying to say with climate change, we need to rest the day. And they're moving now to say the rest day will be Sunday. So that's the correlation. If I could add there add and jump in um, to support my, my brother. Um, well, we know seven Adventists that um, we are in a big uh, controversy um, against our arch enemy, the devil. And we know Jesus Christ is our savior. He's there leading us. But in terms of um, where we are with climate change and how it affects religious liberty, we know that um, the Bible tells us that the devil is uh, wrath with the woman and went to end war with, went to end, make war with the remnant of her seed. However, it's not only the remnant people of God that the devil is at war with. He's at war with the whole world. Revelation yeah. 12, verse 12 tells us, Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and, and of the sea, for the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth he hath but a short time. Revelation 12, 12. Now, God's mm -hmm. servant tells us, um, as, we un as the world tries to get a grip on this climate change, God's servant mm -hmm. tells us in Maranatha, page 176, he says, as men depart further and further from God, Satan is permitted to have power over the children of disobedience. He hurls destruction among them. There is calamity by land and sea. Property and life are destroyed by fire and flood. And Satan resolved to charge this upon those who refuse to bow to the idol he has set up. His agents point to seven Adventists as the cause of the troubles. Now, basically, the climate change, the climate change issue we yeah. know is the devil's plan working in harmony with what uh, 
Elder Clemens said, working in, in league with the papacy to bring a crisis upon the world, which will be a crisis for God's people. Much more could be said, but ultimately this will lead into other areas which Clemens um, brought out. Effectively, we know we are moving towards a mark of the beast and the climate change and these calamities, all of them that we're seeing is the devil's agenda to get God's peoples back against the wall. And this is why we have to daily live our lives as if it is the last, because we do not know what, what crisis or what calamity will ultimately break the world where people will start listening to the devil and say, you know what, it is seven Adventists that are the cause of these things. Can I just say, you know, um, in the Bible it says, study to show yourself approved. Um, we do have to start to really gen up on what really matters. Um, the climate change agenda started roughly roughly in the 19th century, the beginning of the 19th century. Um, now we're in 1995, that was when the finger was pointed at mankind for actually dealing with the global, causing the global warming aspects and the issues. Um, but if you, if you actually, really for yourself, it was actually volcanic um, activity, oceanic activity that, that is known to cause a large portion of the climate change, but yet still, the finger is squarely pointed out to humankind, but that's the devil's, um, that's his role. And of course, it will be targeted more and more at us going forward. But we have, we will have to refute a lot of this, not just accept it, we'll have to study ourselves and get head knowledge to find out what really is behind these things, these disasters. Is it anything we could do? If it's very little to do with us, how can we be blamed for it? And once we start to do our research and we can actually go back and throw the figures back at them, and not just to really push them away but say look we've got a god who we serve who is looking after who has made the world and set it in motion and he set it in motion forever and we can actually lead people to god by standing up in a christ-like way to show them that this isn't what they think it is but some people are sick are severely misguided whereas others know what they're up to and they have a dark agenda to follow yeah well, i think i think, I think um, if i could say if i could just say that uh I think the climate is the one thing that unites the whole planet. It touches everybody more than anything. And this year, you know, this we've called uh, our theme 2020 vision. Looking mm -hmm. back over the year, what COVID has done, COVID has exposed this so clearly. Prior to this year, we were so busy driving and working and, and with our, the buildings and the pollution and everything. When the first lockdown happened, um, all that stopped to some degree. And what people said, look how clear the sky is. Look how blue the water is. Even my neighbor was talking about this. And... It touches the whole world, the climate does. We're all involved. And it impacted everyone to think the world, the planet needs to breathe. It needs a rest. It's so ironic that the George Floyd thing happened and that mantra, I can't breathe, came out. Mm -hmm. And then they transferred it. Like Greta Thunberg said, it's not just us. The planet can't breathe. Mm. And so then there was an idea, we need to give the planet a rest. Mm. And the Green Sabbath project grew as a result of this. Yeah. Yeah. And the plan is to try to have little lockdowns and breaks over the time, Sabbaths for the planet. And then the question is, what day should that Sabbath or that rest be for the planet? Thank you for that. And on Sorry. the... Paul just a minute one point. Uh, did you still want to make a point, Paul, and then I'll come back to Clem? Let Clem speak first, and I'll, I'll just make a quick point, and then we, we can move on. Go on, Clem. Thank you for that. Yeah, I was going to say, I agree 100% with Adrian with the um, COVID. The, the cities across the world are saying when they look at the lead pollution, it's dropped. But it, it's, it's a fake thing, really, um, what, what's happening, because the Vatican has said whether or not the United States um, goes ahead with them, go in unity, join, dovetail with them. They are still going ahead with their mission. Now, we all knew that Mr. Trump was always saying he's not going to uh, go with the carbon, um, lower the emissions in China. Is that those. Mr. Trump? That's Mr. Trump. 
Yeah, he, 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 took, he took America out of the um, uh, Paris, Paris Accord, Agreement. which was an environmental thing, didn't he? Mm, yeah. yeah. So what I'm trying to lead up here to now, um, Adrian, you're quite right. We have a new president-elect coming in. He's a Catholic and the, he, the, and the Vatican get on very well. We are now going to see what America will do. So what I'm going to say to us all, watch this space with America lowering its emissions. Okay. That's what I'm just saying. So get your binoculars out and start focusing and start looking what's happening because this is what we are as Bible students. We're so not just supposed to just hear for ourselves, but as Jackie said earlier on, we must show ourselves approved and look, but not speculate, but we must go with the word of God. Yeah. Oh, thank you for that, Clem. I'd just like to add one different aspect in, in so much that uh, in Matthew 24, we are told that there will be famine, earthquakes, pestilence, and rumors of wars and so forth and so forth. Um, God is, Jesus is telling us that these are signs of the times also. Mm -hmm. So once we see the increase of these things, which I think we are seeing, especially in this year, we had so many um, wild, um, wildfires in California, um, different Australia. floods, Australia. Australia, New Zealand, mm -hmm. um, you know, things happening all over. The, I think in the video, they also showed, showed um, birds falling out, dead out of the sky and That's so right. forth. So all of these things are, are happening in Romans chapter eight, verse 22. It tells us the earth is groaning, groaning uh, you know, because of, of sin. So <laughs> again, I agree. We need to take note that one, it's going to affect because what's going to the long-term thing is that, that these things ultimately will affect our civil liberty, mm -hmm. our religious liberty. Sorry, I didn't get that right. Because mm -hmm. again, when we see these things, we're closer to the end of time. And as we draw closer to the end of time, God's people will be under persecution. Um, our liberties, our freedoms will be taken away because we are Sabbath keepers. So all, all of these... What's the link, though? What's the link between the environment and our persecution? That must be made really clear, the jump. Why is the environment connected to Sabbath keepers, or how will it be? Right, because at the end of the day, what we will see eventually, that will come is that people will be looking at these disasters repeating and be becoming more frequent. And then they will turn around and say, this is because we are not serving God. Yeah. Let he us all yeah. serve God. And the way we can all serve God is to unite on a particular day. day yeah. And when those who are will not unite on that day, that's where we're, in, yeah. that's where we're going to be affected because yeah. um, you know, we know and understand that God's commandments have never changed. They've never been abolished. And the fourth commandment stands and shines brightly that we ought to keep God's seventh day Sabbath. So that's where the issue will finally come to a head. And that's um, why we take note as um, Bible believing um, people, what will happen in the future um, regarding us. Can I, can I, can I enter the positive Clem, just really quickly. Um, yeah. Remember the fires in America. Is it Glasshaven? Where did Ellen G. White live? Where was her estate in America? Elmshaven, Elms Elms yeah. Elms um, the fire raged all around, but mm. didn't touch it. Not, mm. not the, the gatepost, not the pillar box, nothing. So Amen. we don't have to fear if we use God as our pavilion. He will protect mm. us, keep mm. us away from harm and danger, but we have to trust him in the days to come. Yeah, I was just going to say, just, just just to have a look at this last thing where Adrian asks, where does this uh, dovetail in? It's dovetailing in because in Birmingham now, we should have had it started last year and this year, but they put it off to next year. We're going to have a pollution charge where they're going to set a ring road, a, a steel ring around Birmingham, and where cars cannot drive in if your cars don't meet the emission rates. So that's the start of it. What they're thinking of now is to have certain days where the city gets um, fresh air, where no cars come into the city at all. Now, I can put my bottom dollar on which day they're going to choose, which day is not going to come in, the enforcement day. It mm. may be a Tuesday, but sooner or later, that day will be Sunday. Mm. Yeah. And so it's starting very small, and then it's going to 
go out probably to Manchester, Sheffield, everybody's doing it. But they're saying, because last week, that little girl that died about six years ago, they have now said it's because of pollution. pollution. Yeah. First one in the own. world. I'll yeah. never drop back to Adrian, London. can I just interrupt you here? Can I just interrupt you here? Sorry. I know we could spend the whole session mm, yes. about climate yes. change, mm. but I think there's some really interesting things that we ought to be sharing with our audience. So I just earlier wanted on... to say I got, I, got an, I got an 80 quid fine for driving to London. I'll never go back there. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Can't go back right now. It's on tier four. <laughs> Thank you for that reminder, a very, very salutary reminder. Now, Adrian, you mentioned earlier about the current climate that we're living in, and I'm not talking about the climate change issues, but the climate around COVID-19, and LaSalle quite rightly points that we've got a tiered system here in the UK. So what do you think is the link between the COVID-19 lockdown and our surveillance and that impact on our religious liberty? Um, <clears throat> I think this year has really... Um, accelerated processes that were already in place or that were going along at a, a steady uh, pace in terms of uh, keeping an eye on the people, almost of necessity, it was said, you know, the increases uh, of CCTV in different mm -hmm. countries of the world. There was a time when this country, I think we had four million cameras and we were the most surveilled um, country in the world in, in our town centres. And now China has um, uh, two million and they're planning to have uh, six million soon. That's one camera for every two people. Um, mm -hmm. And COVID, because of the danger, the perceived or the real danger to other people, uh, uh, the idea of surveillance, where you are, test and trace, um, mm -hmm. cameras, um, doors in supermarkets not opening, uh, if you if you don't have your mask on in Thailand, these things have greatly accelerated over this year, and COVID has justified that. Right. So to me, that sounds like a civil liberties issue. What's that got to do with religious liberties? <clears throat> well, in terms of uh, religious liberty, mm -hmm. um, when you when you come to the point of uh, whether there's going to be vaccines or not, and what people's views are on whether they should have vaccines. Mm -hmm. um, if there are some people who decide not to have vaccines, then um, they will lose their benefits in the, in the social sphere. Um, and in order to do that, they'll have to know where people are uh, in order to actually identify them. And so surveillance becomes very important then to actually keep an eye on everybody where they are particularly if you are perceived because of your religious beliefs um, to not um, kowtow or, or agree with the system, um, particularly in a thing called um, social credit that has started in China and it's moved into America now where you get benefits from the government mm. if you if you agree with the this government, yeah. move along with the government. So if mm -hmm. issues come along that go against one's personal religious beliefs, and I, I, we can quote many here, then one comes under surveillance, and not just from cameras, but from um, our internet and, and the things that we put down there. We have to meet all this stuff again at some mm -hmm. point. Can I can I add just uh, because I'm very conscious that we you know of the time, um, just that you know we read in Revelation chapter thirteen that um, we'll not be able to at some point to buy or sell, and to be able not to have that introduced, you need a society where people are controlled. Um, you need to be able to identify people where they are, who they are, how they spend their money, you know where they go. You know, so that tells us that that those scriptures tell us that society is going to be, appear is exactly what we are seeing now. We are I, I, Adrian knows how many cameras I can't remember the, the figure of the, how many cameras are in the UK, but we we, we are watched everywhere. Um, our our you know every time you log on to the internet, everything is there um, following you over when you realize it or not. Even ads. 
um, but they pop up in the list. Track where you where you go. All I'm saying is that the society that is coming, that has to come, has to be one of control. And it's all heading to the point where we are not able to buy or sell. And, and very briefly, that issue of buying or selling um, uh, has really sped up. Um, as I, I mentioned in the sermon, um, the, the, the McKinsey Global Money Report has shown that just in this country, uh, spending people who use cash now, 23% of the population, uh, that's all. And, and, and the use of cash has dropped by 50, another 15% yeah. this year because of the COVID situation. So as we move away from cash, there comes a greater control of people. Right, you know, linking up what um, you've just said, Adrian, with what Clem mentioned earlier around all eyes coming to individuals or, or, uh, who are Sabbath keepers, don't you think it might come across as a little paranoid to imagine that Sabbath keepers will actually come under government scrutiny? And, um, you know, what would lead you to think that that would actually be a reality? Well, um, <clears throat> Uh, a man, a philosopher, George Santanyana, once said, "If we do not remember the mis mistakes of the past, we'll be doomed to repeat them." Um, a fascinating piece has just come out recently, and it's not a piece. They've found two thousand pages have been de declassified from um, American FBI um, to say that in uh, in the First World War, um, just around two thousand and uh, uh, sorry, nineteen seventeen. 18, during that war, the FBI, uh, when it was instituted in 1908, it then started to become interested in religious groups. And during World War I, the Seventh-day Adventist Church was surveilled to a huge degree. Um, there's a book about it. Um, it's called The FBI and Religion. And that, that mentions it. And one person has now come across these declassified papers that say that Adventist church was heavily, heavily investigated during World War I. Mm -hmm. So if it could happen in the past, the future is yes, just there all, waiting. We've also got the history of the, um, the old blue laws in America. We weren't, we weren't working under, living under a crisis as per, you know, climate change or something back then. But wherever we, we, we have the majority deeming that their way is right and bringing in policies that they want others to follow, then civil and religious liberties are, are affected. And as um, climate change, as COVID, as, as the technology is all facilitating and allowing more control of the people, then the fear is, is that we're, we're moving, we don't, we're, we're approaching a new dawn where um, at a click of a switch, um, non-compliant people will be forced um, to follow systems that they may not agree with. And um, it's not necessarily that, that people are even doing the worst things. Um, for, for small things, people are, um, sometimes people can be cut off, cut out of systems. Yeah. yeah. Can, I Other, quickly, can I quickly chip in and just say, so what do we do? What would we advise everyone to do? If we can have everything shut down very, very easily now because we're using credit cards, what do we do if we shut down like that? How do we actually carry on without uh, actually um, jeopardizing our liberties and going back on what we're supposed to believe? I think the simple thing, Jackie, for me is um, I remember Elijah yeah. at, the, at, the, at the brook. Um, he had no bread or water. And um, God tells us that when these times come, we have to trust him. We're told that we must stockpile it's just like the manner. If you remember the manner in the um, what's that, what's this, um, with the children mm -hmm. of Israel, those who gathered more, it it was spoiled. So this time period now has to come to a total trust in our Savior, in our God, where God will see us through. So we shouldn't really be panicky, panicky, um, but we mm. must be alert and wise to the situations, what's happening around us, because. God told us, or told the Jews, when you see these things happening, you must flee from the cities. Yes, could exactly. I, could, I, could I just exactly. add as well? Yes, could I just add? It, it, it's interesting because, um, uh, as my brother just mentioned there, it just brought to my mind that we know that since this uh, COVID crisis um, <laughs> and the disruptions that are seen in our communities, the mm -hmm. more wealthy 
amongst us, not necessarily as us as certain Adventists, but among the, the wealthy in the nations, they are, but they are moving to the suburbs and out of the cities because they are, in this case, they're using the technology to work remotely. So if it is response to Jackie, what should we do? Obviously, trust and claim says, trust and pray to God. But where we can make preparations and God opens the way for us, if we can work remotely, if our jobs offer us, then move out from pop centers of populations because we've seen um, with, um, not trying to go off subject, but like with the Black Lives Matter things, when things erupt in a place, um, we can see how the, f the, 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 the forces of the state come in and they're not always the gentlest, are they, with how, with how they operate? So, um, you know, it, it just reminds me that of a quote from um, God's servants who says that uh, um, Satan is, 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 is seeking to sweep away not, not only the law of, uh, uh, not only human law, not only divine law, but all law. And so um, all these different crises point to something big coming where we as a people have to prepare ourselves. Right, thank you very much. Jim, can, that, can, can we, we, we need to move quite swiftly now. Um, there are, are three questions that are, I'm going to ask to, to round up, and I would really like some succinct answers. So COVID-19 and the mark of the beast. There is a lot of um, propaganda going out there that COVID-19 is the mark of the beast. What response do we give to that? No, it's not. No, it's not. <laughs> <That's> it. <laughs> I agree with Jackie. <laughs> Very simple. Um, we've talked about um, Sunday worship. We've, we've talked about the, the Bible Sabbath. It's, it's quite clear that um, the mark of the beast is about a, an issue of worship. worship. And we're not talking about a, a, a vaccine. Now, Well, I, I would think that a very simple proof of this is that um, what the government can do today, if you won't take the vaccine, they could get the military in and force you um, and, and put the vaccine in your yeah. arm by force. Does that mean you've got the mark of the beast? Yeah. Of course. How can God judge you and say yes, that you have the mark of the beast? On you. That's because right. the idea of the mark of the beast is an issue of choice, not of mm. force. So mm. the vaccine cannot be the mark of the beast. Mm. Thank you. Even, even, so even, though, even though the devil will use compulsion, um, will use compulsion, but it's not that type of compulsion we're, 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 we're talking about. Right. Now, we've talked quite um, prolifically on this, this, um, this session about things that appear to be in the future, whilst I admit we've got COVID with us now, but there are some very real issues that are oppressing the members within our church around religious liberties, one of them being employment. Now, um, what are the issues that we need to be concerned about on employment and our religious liberties? Well, with this month, I think, well, I, I think it's important that, that we as a group and religious liberty leaders in other churches be au fait with the sub subject so much that we can provide support for people in situations, teachers, medical people who come up with the requirements of their employment and when that comes up against the principles of their conscience. I was going to say as well, for me, um, I, I, I can see the change as what you asked, Glenda. Um, 10 years, 10, 12 years ago, I'm not going to name my employer, but my employer changed our contracts um, and we had no choice in it. And our contracts, I work five days a week, which is Monday to Friday. Now, the contracts changed. Um, we had no say in it. The unions didn't uh, stand up and say, oh, no, no, you can't do this. But my contracts changed that I will work on a Saturday or a Sunday when required. And the reason why they said that the services that we offer as a, as, as a, as, as a government, because I work for the government, that they say, well, there are some people who work from home, who, who work. Mm -hmm. And when I am going knocking their doors or trying to make contact with them, I can't contact them between Monday and Friday. So they say to me, well, Clem, or what are they saying to the, to the people of, of, of Birmingham, you need to go and visit them on the weekend. Mm -hmm. So the time will come um, when uh, those tests are coming to us so what i'm basically saying things haven't arrived there yet but the water is getting warmer and warmer and warmer our civil liberties are being eroded i didn't say religious liberties our civil liberties are being eroded right. and then from the civil mm -hmm. we then will move yeah. on to 
the religious aspect, where my religious aspect there now, on me to work on a Sabbath, is going against the European Convention because of my belief. Can I quickly chip in um, um, with a really, really small um, testimony of what happened and all you guys know about it when um, a couple of months ago I was asked to um, to lead uh, my department working on, on Saturdays basically to lead the team and, and various areas um, and it was my job to actually to deal with that. Um, obviously I couldn't do that, I spoke to my manager quite a few times, um, I was asked to actually announce it to, the, to all the staff and to run with it and I couldn't and I knew that my job would be possibly in jeopardy and it was at one stage if I didn't do this and I prayed about it, all of yourselves prayed for me, other people prayed and God did a miracle. Not only did I have to um, not do that um, task, but I was removed from the role, um, given a job where I could work indefinitely at home um, and uh, with um, lots of other benefits in there. And basically, if you stand up for God in this difficult time, when it seems like your back is against the wall, he will stand up for you. And he did it for me. So I'm a living testimony of that. So it will get difficult for teachers, not just for teachers, frontline staff, frontline workers as well are really up against the cost, but never doubt that God will bring you through the most impossible looking situation. If you stand up for him first, he'll do everything for you. Thank you. Wow. And that's one of the primary reasons why this organisation exists, um, to support individuals around their religious liberties. Um, and I, sorry, can I just add, if, if anyone goes to our website, rlup.org, um, under employment, there are, there are a lot of agencies there, uh, links to agencies that can help you in tribunals um, or even letter writing and uh, as such. Um, so have a look at the way, if, you, if you're in difficulties over the Sabbath, have a look at the website, have a look at the help that is there. I'm sure you can get, benef uh, get a benefit from it. What's the website, Paul? What's the website? Yes, Arlac, Arlac, sorry, get it right, dot .org. That's A- uh Okay, thank you. And then the, the final question I would like us to um, address is one that's really uh, prominent within the press and evident for our children and parents. And it's one of relationship and sex education. We all know that um, in September of this year, there should have been a, a new proposed change to relationship and sex education. Paul, do you want to tell us what that change was and did it come in and what that means for us? Um, yes, um, really going back to probably 2017, um, the government has uh, in its mindset to change the way we um, view um, the LGBT community. And so it's, 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 set, a, it's set about to promote the, um, the idea that this, these lifestyles are as equal as as a heterosexual lifestyle. So um, they've, they've wanted to promote it in several areas and one of them being education. And so in education itself, the, the idea that um, children need to be taught on these subjects in these areas. So they've revamped um, sex education and relationships um, to come under the banner of what we call RSE, which is Relationships Sex Education. Now, as you mentioned that um, from September um, 2020 gone, um, all schools should have been um, teaching this subject. However, because of COVID-19, um, there's, well, if they haven't started it, the government has said you don't need to start it until the summer of 2021. Um, like I said, it's it, relationships um, education is something that we'll endeavour to incorporate a lot of different subjects. Um, and um, this is going to be taught in primary schools and also secondary schools. The sex education part should really only be taught in secondary schools, but is also taught in, um, well, some, some, some primary schools are actually teaching sex education. And, and I will say that there shouldn't really be. And as parents, you have an opt-out. Um, if, if your primary school is teaching sex education, parents, you have an opt-out. There is no opt-out for um, relig sorry, um, relationships education at all in primary school. But if they are teaching sex education in primary school, you have that opt-out. It's different from when in secondary school regarding sex education. 
because um, sex education is really, if you want to remove your child, you have to contact the um, head teacher um, and ask permission. And when the child is 15 years old, that child can decide, the law says that child can decide for itself. So those are real changes, but Adrian will probably add a little bit more onto that. I, I, I think the idea, um, this is real, it's, it's not just um, a theoretical thing. I mean, we have a lady this, this year in, in the country, Kirsty Higgs, uh, who's lost her job because she was a Christian and she spoke about her uh, understanding of the biblical view. The idea is trying to normalise um, same-sex relationships um, in the eyes of children and the idea of gender fluidity. And it's presented to the young ones in the, with these type of books now that uh, they're presenting in school, like this one, Heather has two mummies. Um, and they look at families and they, when they have these books for the five-year-olds, they show all types of um, mixes and ways in which families can mix. I'm not talking about racial mixing, I'm talking about gender mixing, uh, two fathers, two dads, or, or gender changing, and there's just loads of them. And they're presented with lovely um, pictures and colors inside and, ca and cartoon characters um, so that the children get this idea uh, of the love, lovely uh, and cuddly idea of, of the concept. Um, now, we're not against people or human beings, but if we stand for a biblical position, we are now we can now be seen as haters and be prosecuted. That is the situation. That's how it touches religious liberty. I will add on to that also that um, you know we've had um, what Adrian said is is right. We've had um, this has happened already. It happened in Scotland where they've brought drag queens in to to. Um, primary school children and they've taken lessons and so forth. Um, some of the councils, because the material or the guidelines for, for the teachers have been that bad that um, Barnsley Council, um, Warwickshire Council had to, well, under the threat of um, legal action, they had to re withdraw it, withdraw what they were offering to the schools because some of the stuff was that explicit. Some of the homework that children were, were given led to um, sites like to even you know i wouldn't go to you know so um it's 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 about a, a mindset change really that we are made in the image of god and if you can distort that image which satan ideally wants to um he's doing everything he can for that so he's going after our children and so you know the the government did say to to parents that you know schools must consult Every school has to um, put on the website what the agenda is um, for the, what the curriculum is for the year regarding RSE. It's got to be integrated between all the subjects, not just have their own particular standalone subject. But what does RSE stand for? Relationship, Relationship, sex, education. So again, go into your school, find out what is being taught into your school to your child, be proactive. You know, we have rights under the Human Rights Act. We have the freedom of belief, freedom of worship, you know, um, freedom of, of, of against in Article 14 against discrimination, which the, you know, LGBT community like to use as well. But that applies to us also. Find out what is being taught to your child, you know, um, be proactive, look at their homework, um, see what they are doing, see what is going to be said. But like I said, some schools don't really start till next year. So, you know, they have to, put it on the website uh, and they have to consult a, a proper consultant consultation between the parents. So let us not just sit back and think, oh, well, let's not do nothing. The idea is that we move against these things for the really the idea that we can evangelize, giving us more time before probation closed down, before everything closed down. We have, we have nothing to say. We have souls to win and it's an opportunity to witness to others as well. So, you know, it's these things, you know, that come about, Satan is bringing these things about, but, you know, we are to look for what is God is calling us as a particular people to do. Yeah. Right. Can I just say, Paul, um, just to go on the back of what you're saying, um, God works in a mysterious way. And I know in December, um, Kira, regarding Kira Bell, um, yeah. 
the, the, the High Court made a ruling and it was a fantastic ruling that they made. And I'm just going to just read exactly verbatim what they said. It states, it's highly unlikely a child under 13 could ever give valid consent to treatment and doubtful for a 14 to 15 years of age giving valid consent. The courts even went further group by saying 16 to 17 years old might not be capable of making consent and should go to court for an order. So how does that reconcile, Paul? Because I know this is one of your expert fields. If the courts are now saying that some of this education that they are teaching the children and a child under 13 cannot make a decision, how can they be then teaching it? Um, Before we go any further, can we just clarify who Kira Bell is in case individuals aren't aware of, of, of who she is? Oh, Kira Bell was a young lady who went for puberty blockers. So when young children go into puberty, they then say, oh, I don't want to be a boy anymore. So they'll take blockers or I don't want to be a girl and they'll block their puberty growth. So right. Kira Bell was the young lady who went to court and said, she took her puberty blockers and she said, I was not properly guided. Makes it easier for transition, doesn't it? Oh, so, yeah. So for just adding a little bit more is that, um, you know, we've only got one centre in England, the Travis Stock Centre, where you can get um, a sex change. And she, she, she was, you know, trans transitioning from uh, um, a, a woman to a, a boy. And so she took all those puberty blockers and so forth. And, and later on, she's now 23 years old. Um, she realised that she, she, she made a mistake. And so she thought she was badly advised. And so she um, took a case. It was not just her, it was someone else as well. And, th and this case was reviewed um, by three high court judges and and basically they were told that, you know, this has to stop. Um, you know, you, you have to prove now before a judge, three judges that you can um, uh, understand the short term and also the consequences of long term taking this medicine because um, these things are kind of, not kind of, these are, are irreversible and there's no long term studies to, for the effects that they have on, um, on, um, on children, you know, on people as, as such, and so I've, I've, I've seen a, I've seen a couple of documentaries with people who have gone through the change and then regretted it mm. afterwards and said they did not they wish they had more information. And apparently, if the hormones, if a children are are left for eighteen months when there there's this upheaval with their hormones, if they're just left alone, apparently they settle down again. And she even said this herself. If she if, she feels if she had been, been left and had been settled and then continuing the normal gender uh, growth. Yeah. Well, sorry. Yeah, I was just saying what we what we find is that regarding Clem's question, is that you know um, there's a there's lobby there's um, people who lobby governments and pressure groups that are out there that want this this thing to be taught. So even though this case is regarding. Um, um, transgenderism you know the, we have days where in, in primary schools where we have uh, wear what you like they I mean that they encourage boys to come to school with dresses you know um you know you can call me if you choose whatever today to my name's paul tomorrow my paul. name may be sam you know or, 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 oh, or paulette. 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 Oh, paulette thank you <laughs> yeah so we have the idea um that you should be um you can be what you want to be. You know, there is no gender or there's no um, two genders. You know, there's there's a hundred genders as, as it was pointed out um, um, in the past. And so th there is this program of, uh, of what we call a paradigm shift in the mindset of um, society into, you know, you do what you want, you can be who you want. As long as I'm not, I'm not hurting no one, well, what's the problem? You know, so what's the issue with this in religious liberties? How does it impact our religious liberties? Oh, well, be because we believe in the word of God, we know that God made Adam and God made Eve. And, and, and therefore, um, God has said that, you know, in Psalms chapter eight, what is man that thou art mindful of him and the son of man that thou visit? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels. You know, man is made in the image of God. And, and, and and, it, and, it, and it's got less 
less protection for the parents because I assume that if if you've got a child and a child wants to is going through this kind of a issue and um, parents would obviously want to give their children religious parents would I suppose all parents but we're talking in a, from a religious point of view religious people would want to obviously advise their children in accordance with what Paul has just said there but the law could be or previously in, in some areas the law could be against you um but what Clem's brought out there seems that um there is at least on that particular point there may be a little bit more balancing out for um you know if you are a, if you're a, a, a religious uh, person and you may and you know you um you've got something to say some 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 sort of maybe more right to say to your to, to the people who maybe are advising your children no let let them stay is that right? it doesn't just it doesn't just ch touch parents and children it touches mm. employees teachers mm. Teachers who are under pressure to teach um, the things that mm. Paul has referred to. Doctors who have Christian beliefs, who may be under pressure to administer um, hypothalamic yes, yes, yes. hormone blockers. Pharmacists who have Christian beliefs. All these may come under the yes. radar and under fire. So, Jackie, um, it touches Christian employees in these areas as well. As well. And uh, before I forget, I, I should say, you know, we've, uh, we've worked with um, Doreen Coke. And she provided um, a guide for us. It was called Gender Neutral Professional Guide um, for Teachers. If you're Where's a she teacher, from? Uh, sorry, London. She's from London, Peckham. Yeah. yeah. So if, if you are a teacher and you need advice, how I'm, how, you know, you walk into a classroom uh, uh, for two years. This person is 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 been Sammy, but 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 as a boy. But now this person walks into your classroom, and and it and it's and it's uh, I want to say uh, it's Mary, you know. So how do you approach that situation? She's there's a guideline on our website. Um, like I said, that's the title there under education by Doreen Doreen Coke. Um, read through those there because it's, it's, a, it's some wonderful advice that she she offers for um, teachers who find themselves in that situation. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to draw this session we could go on forever in fact we could have a session on each of the areas that we've touched on today so let me remind you of our website it's um rlaac.org where information is available to you every member that is, is present here and three members who are not are available to support you on your religious liberty issues we've spoken about climate change we've moved through covid and the vaccine we've talked about issues that are um, in, in the future and issues that are currently present, particularly issues around um, education and employment. So may I, I finish with the point that Jackie quite poignantly stated about studying to show ourselves approved. There are things that will be happening rapidly in our very immediate future and we need to ensure that we stand assured. Mm -hmm. So as we end this session, can I turn to the chair of our ALAC to close us in prayer? Eternal Father, we've come through quite a year. We find ourselves at the end of this year, and you have known it was coming. The year is yet to finish, but we look back with 2020 vision, and we see these things that have moved forward and accelerated. We ask that you will guide us. Help us not to be afraid. Help us to give us your wisdom and your guidance and your passion so that we can use these things as an opportunity to spread the message of the love of Christ and the understanding, the interpretation of the, the events in, in the light of the prophecies that are written down in your book. Please help us as churches to be proactive and imaginative and creative in our ways of spreading your message, particularly in relation to religious liberty. In the name of Jesus, amen. 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 Well. The nearly 14 ton bell that gives the tower its nickname. The bells that chime on the quarter hour sit around it. Their strikes are controlled by the intricate ticking mechanism at the heart of the tower. 
It keeps the clock accurate to within just two seconds a week. On each side, 312 shards of opal glass make up the clock face. The copper minute hands are 14 feet long, as tall as a double-decker bus. These famous dials have kept London running on time for 160 years. And as we've uh, just heard in the last couple of minutes, the fire at Parisian Springs, a watch and act, has escalated in the last little while from an advice to a watch and act and straight to a leave now. Carl, what can you tell us about when this fire broke out this afternoon and where? It was probably around 5 o'clock and it was down at Parisian Springs. The situation, it is a very fast moving fire. Global businesses, international cooperation and the striving for ideals, these are all possible because for millennia on a global scale, nature has been largely predictable and stable. Now, in the space of one human lifetime, indeed, in the space of my lifetime, all that has changed. The Holocene has ended. The Garden of Eden is no more. Our house is on fire. I am here to say our house is on fire. According to the IPCC, we are less than 12 years away from not being able to undo our mistakes. At places like Davos, people like to tell success stories. But their financial success has come with an unthinkable price tag. And on climate change, we have to acknowledge that we have failed. All political movements in their present form have done so. And the media has failed to create broad public awareness. But Homo sapiens have not yet failed. Yes, we are failing, but there is still time to turn everything around. We can still fix this. We still have everything in our own hands. Now is the time to speak clearly. Solving the climate crisis is the greatest and most complex challenge that Homo sapiens has ever, have ever faced. The main solution, however, is so simple that even a small child can understand it. We have to stop the emissions of greenhouse gases. And either we do that or we don't. You say nothing in life is black or white, but that is a lie, a very dangerous lie. Either we prevent a 1.5 degree of warming or we don't. Either we avoid setting off that irre irreversible chain reaction beyond human control, or we don't. Either we choose to go on as a civilization, or we don't. That is as black or white as it gets. We must change almost everything in our current societies. The bigger your carbon footprint is, the bigger your moral duty. The bigger your platform, the bigger your responsibility. Adults keep saying we owe it to the young people to give them hope. But I don't want your hope. I don't want you to be hopeful. I want you to panic. I want you to feel the fear I feel every day. And then I want you to act. I want you to act as if you would in a crisis. I want you to act as if the house was on fire. Because it is.
Breaking news that five a major earthquake hits off the coast of Jamaica around two this afternoon. Our Lauren St. Germain joining us now in studio. Lauren, people reported feeling this all the way in South Florida. That's exactly right. So this video is from Miami around 3.30 this afternoon. You see some people chose to evacuate the tall buildings. There are no signs of physical damage at this point, but fire rescue teams are inspecting buildings as we speak. So this is video someone took in Miami inside of his apartment. You can see the lights swaying back and forth, and this is pretty typical of the video we're starting to see on social media from South Florida. So right now we're waiting to get more information about injuries or damage on the islands. The earthquake hit just south of Cuba and northwest of Jamaica, kind of right where this the big yellow dot is. It was a magnitude 7.7 quake, which is considered major and can cause some pretty serious damage. So we're also starting to get some video out of Jamaica this evening. Right here, this is staff at a school in Kingston helping students just as they do in earthquake drills get outside into the parking area. Again, so far, no reports of injuries or major damage. But let's send things over to Chief Meteorologist Dennis Phillips. And Dennis, there are now several aftershocks happening. Yeah, Lauren, there are. And let's set the record straight here. This is your center right now, pretty much equidistant between Cuba, the Caymans, and Jamaica. So fortunately, it landed in a place where there was really no land very close to where the epicenter was. It went down about six miles. Very fortunate because 7.7 .7 is massive. That is a huge earthquake. There will be aftershocks for weeks. Now, interestingly enough, it is not on the same fault line that caused the Puerto Rican earthquakes over the last couple of weeks. Totally separate fault. But as we said, there's your center. There were the concerns about tsunami, maybe a three or four foot rise in water. At this point, we haven't heard that. And, and truthfully, Hopefully, if we haven't by now, we're not going to. The threat of tsunamis usually only last about a half hour, maybe 45 minutes away. This is one of those aftershocks that Lauren mentioned. This is 4.9 just east of Grand Cayman, about 18 miles. Now, we obviously think about it here in the Bay Area because a lot of our cruise ships go from Tampa right to Grand Cayman or right to Jamaica. So again, this is certainly an area where a lot of folks from the Bay Area could be. But if you look at the bigger picture right now, this is just where we're talking about. But that fault does go into southern Cuba as well. So bottom line, I would expect more aftershocks, nothing close to that main 7.7. .7. And as always, we'll continue to monitoring it 24-7. Wendy? All right, thanks. Uh, one thing that we have forgotten about our history as well is that the federal government, um, they have they formed the, the so-called Federal Bureau of Investigation. It was called the Bureau of Investigation. They formed that in 1908. And during World War I, they had the first chance to really actively do their work in America. And they heavily targeted religions. And one of the religions that they targeted was Seventh-day Adventism. Mm. And why are they targeting Seventh-day Adventism? They're targeting Seventh-day Adventism because they are targeting all groups that they perceive to be liberal. And so the federal government during World War I was convinced that Adventists were socialists, communists, and that everything we were publishing was quote unquote red. Wow. And I mean R-E-D. So like not, I mean the color. Okay? Yeah. And so they're doing this and they're saying this and they're, they're infiltrating our camp meetings. They're infiltrating our churches. They are confiscating our mails. They are intercepting our telegrams. They are doing all sorts of stuff 
to block what we do. I could go on and on about that. Well, but we, the point and the, well, the thing I've I want to stress heard, is this. Can you, can, I'm sorry, can you go back over that? I've never <laughs> heard that before, not, not anything close to that. So don't feel, don't feel like time is an issue right now. Can you okay. talk about that a little bit more? I mean, they were like intercepting our mail and telegraphs. And, oh, yeah. This wow. is a time when um, uh, the First Amendment rights in this country had never been defended in courts. Mm. Okay. And so America, the American federal government, rode roughshod over all First Amendment rights during the First World War. And it was only going to be later. And they, they, they did throughout the 20th century. But this is the clearest time that they did. So this, is, so, not, this is not conspiracy theory stuff. This is oh just Oh, my word, no. I, open, have, I have over 2,500 yeah. pages of declassified FBI files yeah. that I found. Wow. Um, and and no, we didn't know about this before. So we just simply did not know about it. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it's no surprise that you're hearing it for the first time. Mm. I have shared this in a couple of academic papers, and there is a podcast with the Adventist Peace Fellowship where I talk about this some that's online. Uh, someone has asked uh, a question for Jonathan. Uh, how could a universal day of rest be feasible across nations with varying cultures and ways of life? Uh, excellent question. Uh, I, I myself am uh, ambivalent about the term universal day of rest because I think it implies things that I'm not sure I favor. Um, of course, this project is not about me by any means. Uh, I think a day of universal rest sounds better to me. Uh, again, I see this as a voluntary thing. I, I see our mission as one of education and advocacy. My dream, my fantasy is to have a billion, two billion Jews, Christians, and Muslims keeping some form of a day of rest on the day that they choose to do it. So I don't see a need to have all monotheists keeping a single day. Uh, I don't see the need to have the whole world keep a single day. This to me uh, seems best as a voluntary project that individuals and communities take on themselves. I don't really, I've lived in Germany, I've lived in Israel where both countries that have uh, official days of rest, um, in Germany, the day of rest is on the Christian uh, Sabbath, Sunday. As a Jew, that's highly inconvenient for me, but I actually have no problem with it. I find it a beautiful way to uh, enforce a kind of day of rest. Uh O oh Maria, tu risplendi sempre nel nostro cammino come segno di salvezza e di speranza. Noi ci affidiamo a te, salute degli infermi, che presso la croce sei stata associata al dolore di Gesù, mantenendo ferma la tua fede. Tu, salvezza del popolo romano, sai di cosa abbiamo bisogno. E siamo certi che provvederai perché, come a Cana di Galilea, possa tornare la gioia e la festa dopo questo momento di prova. Aiutaci, Madre del Divino Amore, a conformarci al volere del Padre e a fare ciò che ci dirà Gesù, che ha preso su di sé le nostre sofferenze e si è caricato dei nostri dolori per portarci attraverso la croce alla gioia della resurrezione. Amen. Sotto la tua protezione cerchiamo rifugio, Santa Madre di Dio. Non disprezzare le suppliche di noi che siamo nella prova e liberaci da ogni pericolo, o Vergine gloriosa e benedetta.
you never want a serious crisis to go to waste. And what I mean by that, it's an opportunity to do things that you think you could not do before. I The COVID-19 pandemic has forced different industries to alter their everyday operations to suit the new normal. A shop in Thailand went a notch higher to ensure its customers wear face masks. A viral video which is now doing the rounds of social media shows the shop with a scanner-like machine at the entrance which scans the face of the visitor and checks the body temperature. If the visitor does not have a face mask on and has a fever, the door does not open. A number of shops have now adopted this new technology in the country. The city of Lund in southern Sweden dates back to medieval times. Over the centuries, it's witnessed plenty of change, but now there's a whole new sort of evolution going on. I'm here to meet some of the thousands of people in the country who are adapting their own bodies, who are inserting microchips under their skin. It means they may never have to carry a house key, train ticket or bank card ever again. This is a microchipping party. <laughs> Hannah's getting an electronic chip implanted into her hand. She believes one day we'll all be chipped like her. So congratulations, Hannah. Thank you. You've been chipped? Yes, I have. How does it feel? It feels good. I'm, I'm excited to see what I'll be able to do now. Can I touch it? Yeah, you can, you can feel it there. I feel like this is the future. It's the next big thing that's going to happen. Happy cyborg birthday. Happy cyborg birthday to you. <laughs> Congratulations. How about Shem Yawashai? Double honors to the elders of GMS Great Millstone and all the brothers within the highways and the byways that did work at the most side in sincerity and in truth. Right, shalom. All right, right now we are gonna do a breakdown on the cashless system we are going to Jamaica because Jamaica moved right now to a cashless society. Right, the government and the people are lead them into into the into the ways of the so-called white man. Right, everything them do, the, the so-called white man do over overseas, what America do, Jamaica follow. Right, so right now Jamaica plan to implement a cashless society. Right, they plan to implement a one ID. We have all information on it. Right. And um, 
them are put in place right now. Right now, them are put everything in place to receive the RFID chip. Right? The main hope of a nation lies in the proper education of its youth. These words, spoken by the Dutch theologian Erasmus in the 15th century, are as true today as they were back then. Now, in the United Kingdom, we are introducing in September 2020 new regulations which require all schools, whether independent, maintained, Christian or otherwise, new teaching requirements which will include relationships education for primary school, relationships and sex education for secondary school, and health education for all schools. The biggest shake-up in sex education for almost two decades has been announced. Children will learn about gay and trans relationships in schools from the age of five. The guidance says schools can decide what is appropriate to teach and when, but LGBT people should be respected in British society and their relationships protected by law. To be giving our children information, to be sexualising our children too young is not good. What is sex education like? Who is teaching it and what are they teaching in school? Children and young people today are growing up in an increasingly complex world and living their lives seamlessly online and off. For relationships education and RSE, the aim is to put in place the building blocks needed for positive and safe relationships of all kinds, starting with the family and friends and moving out to other kinds of relationships, including those online. I think a lot of parents are concerned about RSE and relationship education because there's a lot that we don't know. Schools even and local authorities don't know what is going to be taught as part of this. So there's a lot of guessing as to what this will be and what it'll mean. This has already been hugely controversial. Many parents saying, why on earth would you want to give this kind of advice to kids of five years old? The Department of Education has been very vocal in insisting that LGBT elements now form part of the teaching that all of our schools in the United Kingdom, regardless of religious character, must teach. They've done so under numerous banners, inclusivity, modern British values, anti-bullying, and tolerance, just to name a few. So the million dollar question is, what does relationships education and RSE actually entail? Nobody should lose their job for sharing information with parents. I just thought it was a petition that I just received as an email. I shared it and I just thought that was the end of it. And for the school to take sides with one parent who has complained is hard to believe. I've been working at um, the secondary school for um, a total of seven years. So one year was as a temporary position and then it became permanent. So I've been there for a total of seven years. And, um, and everything's fine, you know, everything has been fine for, for myself working at the secondary school. I've had no problems at all with school, with children, I've had no problems. I'm just, a, I'm a Christian, I follow God's law, 
and I'm teaching my children God's law so they can walk it out too. It's just such a shame that I cannot share this information with my friends who know I'm a Christian. I was given this letter um, from the primary school. It's just inviting parents to come and have a look. Um, it says here, this year we are using several storybooks to help our school community promote diversity and celebrate difference. Children will become very familiar with the phrase, no outsiders in our school. I don't know what I was expecting. I just knew that, what did it mean by equality and diversity? I just didn't know, you know, the letter was, wasn't very clear. And there was only three parents um, that were there. One was a grandparent, and then there was myself, and there was another parent. And the, the books were laid out. Um, to me, it didn't seem that it was just about anti-bullying. There seemed to be something more underlying, you know, like Jacob's in a new dress, and also, you know, the red crayon, you know, how they could, children could choose their own gender, it, it appeared to me. Um, so yeah, so it, was, it seemed very confusing for my child because of our Christian beliefs. These are the um, Facebook posts that I shared on my Facebook account, my personal Facebook account. So this is the, the Judy Bessa, they're doing the Jacob's new dress and the red crown story. And then I put another post on there on the 24th of October 2018. I didn't know at that time really what a big impact all of this was going to have. I just thought it was a petition that I just, I just received as an email. I shared it and I just thought that was the end of it. I just, you know, parents could sign it if they wanted to and they didn't have to sign it. They just, just, just shared the information. But did I think it would get to this? No. They thought the post that I was sharing was homophobic and very um, like negative. Did you realise that other parents can see these? And um, so I just thought, well, I suppose it's on Facebook. I suppose people are going to see them. Um, and I didn't really think I did anything wrong. And then I obviously was sent home and I thought, you know, why am I being sent home? You know, I've not done anything wrong. I just shared in some information to parents about you know what the government's planning and and a critique from you know an article on on, on a couple of books that are uh, being read. So um, I came home, I cried because I was in shock, I suppose, but I still didn't think I did anything wrong. It's shocking to think that I've lost my job because of one parent who has complained to the school because they didn't agree with um, what I shared um, on my Facebook page. And for the school to, to take sides with that parent is hard to believe. So the police will be um, uh, approaching large groups that seem to exceed the six and encouraging and explaining to people what the rules are and hoping that they will then uh, comply. You know, the, we know from the first lockdown the vast majority of people in this country recognised our individual duty to our collective health and complied in their tens of millions. Uh, we're confident people will do the same this time. We found in the first lockdown, as I say, that tens of millions of people uh, complied. We handed out a tiny number of fixed penalty notices in the scale of a population of whatever, 65 uh, million people, and hopefully that will be the case. But where people are resistant and where people refuse to comply, the police do have the option of a fixed penalty notice. You know, what we hope is that people will be um, encouraged 
uh, by the police uh, if they are forced to call and I hope they won't be mm. that they're encouraged and uh, the explanation will be enough and we know from past experience the 99.9% .9 of cases that is the case right people recognize that this is a very serious situation we have to protect particularly those in society who are vulnerable that means we all have to be responsible if they think there's a gathering of concern they should call the non-emergency number and let the police know um, we're going to have these uh, COVID marshals spread across the country. They've been working very well in places like Leeds and Cornwall to go and explain to people and encourage them to comply. Uh, but if people are concerned, then yes, they should ring the non-emergency number and the police can then make a judgment.
Welcome everybody and happy Sabbath to you. First of all, let's pray. Eternal Father, we ask that you will speak to us today and guide the words as they enter the minds and hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. At the beginning of this year, I remember a certain incident when I had gone to a hotel to pick someone up in the evening. As I drove into the car park, I remember seeing a really smart BMW, bright yellow. <clears throat> it was top of the range and there was a young man sitting in there looking very proud with his girlfriend at the side of him, uh, a little guy he was, and I drove past where he was parked and I drove round to a separate section and he was just about, I don't know, a few yards behind me and I stopped the car to wait for my passenger and I was looking at my phone. Suddenly, there was an almighty roar of an engine, pop, 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 and bang. This car just shot past me and veered out of the car park. And I could hear it go around the front of the hotel and zoom off on the motorway. It was, and it moved so fast. I mean, the car park wasn't very big, but it must have gone around that corner at nearly 30 miles an hour. And then I saw the most bizarre thing. The person, the young man who was sitting in this car, running, running across the grass, all he had was his shirt and underpants, running behind the car. And as he was running, another car, a small little black car, followed and the two cars zoomed out. And then after that, then the girl who was in the car, she was running behind him and she was crying. What it turned out that had happened, it was a carjack. Just behind me, about 20 yards behind me, Someone had got out of the black car, seen the sports car, opened it, hit the guy with a hammer on his head, dragged him and the girl out of the car and took their car. To me, it was like a dream. One moment they were sitting in the car so comfortably and relaxed, leaning backwards. The next minute they were running to try Hopelessly, I mean, it was a bizarre situation. Car zooms off at over 30 miles an hour and you're running behind the car. But what else could they do? They were in shock. As I gave my report to the police, I saw the, the man sitting in the front of the hotel covered in silver foil and um, blood pouring from his skull. It made me think of a text in the Bible. It made me think of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 3. It made me think of that saying where it says, And when they shall say peace and safety, sudden destruction shall come. As we look back over this year, it has been like no other. That has become a cliche for all of you listening, no doubt. We've entitled our, our presentations today as 2020 Vision. Now I have looked up 2020 Vision and what it means is to be able to see clearly by 20 feet in front of you to have good vision. And we look back in this year and to not be able to see that it was different from any other year in the lifetime of most people alive on the planet, one would have to be willfully blind. 
So this is how we find ourselves. No one would have thought at the beginning of the year that we would have come to the point that we are at this point now. Even when I go up the escalator, look, this week, going up the escalator in Sainsbury's, seeing all the people coming down with masks on their faces. I heard of a man this year who was in a coma and he came out during the period of lockdown. I think he was in the coma for a long time before all this craziness started. And I thought, what would that be like? You wake up into a world that is totally different from the one where you first lost consciousness, where everyone is wearing masks. When I went up the escalator, I was thinking, this is like a dream. Because I, I, it, it dawned on me for one of the first times in my life, that, uh, in this year, that not only are all these people wearing masks coming down the escalator towards me and past me, but 7.5 billion, nearly 8 billion people on the planet, everyone else virtually is wearing masks like this. What on earth is happening? Someone said to me, oh yes, it's just in the West. It's just Western people because that's where it's affected, but not in the far out place of the world. So straight away, I looked online and I, looked at, I went into the Amazonian rainforest and I looked in the Brazilian rainforest and I looked at the Watutsi tribesmen in Kenya. And lo and behold, everybody was wearing masks. And not only that, the Watutsi tribesmen had masks on and they had mobile phones, as you'll see, uh, hopefully, on our presentation that we have had for you today. What this shows is that the world has become a small place. It has become a place where it can be controlled. The whole idea of globalization has become a reality more than in any other time in the history of the world. And I think of at this time, there have been people who say, oh yes, but there've been two world wars. That have, that's affected people. Oh yes, that's quite right. It has affected people. But war, is understandable. You know war. war. War brings about fighting. War brings about death. War brings about um, people all doing things that they wouldn't do in normal life. But when we entered into this year, there was no world war. No world war was beginning. And yet, there was a change that drew everyone on the planet into that. People say, oh yes, it's like the Spanish flu in, in 1918. Well, not quite. Because in that time, you did not have globalization. You did not have a time when the entire planet could be controlled. And that's why the prophecies of Jesus only have relevance for this time. He was speaking about the end time in his time. As I've said before, that. When he said there should be wars and rumours of wars and earthquakes, all those things couldn't have had relevance in his time because you didn't have the internet, you didn't have radio or television. So if you had wars in a certain place, if, say you had an earthquake in China, they wouldn't have known about it in Nazareth. If you had an earthquake, um, I don't know, a famine in Africa, they wouldn't have known about it in Nazareth. It's only now that those things have global significance. And more than that, we find ourselves in a situation for the first time in my lifetime where the issue of religion, the issue of liberty has touched nearly all aspects of our lives. Now the idea, we're talking about religious liberty here today. Religious liberty means not just the liberty of Christians, it means the liberty of everybody. This is the one thing that God respects and, and holds dear above all things, the freedom of choice. And so liberty, religious liberty, is not just liberty to believe in God, it is freedom not to believe. 
freedom to believe anything you want to believe. This is so important in the eyes of God. This is what defines us as human beings. And because God holds this so dear, you will not find any greater condemnation in the entire Bible than that that is found in Revelation chapter 14, when it speaks against those who receive the mark of the beast that has been described in Revelation 13. God holds this so dear because freedom is what defines us as human beings, as free human beings. And that is how God created us. That's how the entire problem started in the book, in the book of Genesis in the Garden of Eden. Freedom. Freedom to choose, freedom to believe or not to believe. And God, knowing, knowing that it would cause this amount of problem and involve him having to come here as a man and live this life and be put to death. This plan was made before the the actual creation of the world, the Bible tells us, before the foundation of the earth. And yet he still did it because God believes in this most precious thing, freedom to choose. And so we find this year that this has been something that has drawn everybody into the same arena. And so the Christian now can no longer hide. The Christian's involved. If you're a Christian teacher, you have to decide now whether you're going to um, agree to teach your children about different issues of sexuality. When the, 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 the Lord of the land says, you've got to teach these children that marriage is not just between a man and a woman. You've got to teach these children about gender fluidity. If you're a doctor, you have to decide about whether you're going to give um, hypothalamic hormone blockers to, to young, young people who decide or their parents bring them to you to say they feel they're not sure about their sexuality and they believe they were born in the wrong gender. You've got to now decide whether you're going to give them the hormone blockers or not. Pharmacy, pharmacy um, uh, organisations, pharmacists, you have to decide whether you're going to take, um, prepare the prescription. And now, at this end of the year, health workers, you've got to decide whether what you believe, and I'm not here to tell you what to believe, I'm here to just portray what is happening. Say you're a Christian health worker. Say you believe that you shouldn't take the vaccine. You don't even have to be a Christian to, or to, to, to decide that. You could be someone else. And not all Christians believe that. I'm not here to tell you what to believe or what to do. But if you decide that that's not what you're going to do, then you become perceived because of what you believe as a threat, a health threat to those who you're meant to be looking after. So then what happens to you? Will you lose your job? I've already seen these statements out there saying no jab, no job. I've heard of um, Matt Hancock say that he would not outrule or overrule the idea of mandatory vaccines, but we don't know. I had a girl ring me uh, uh, this week Asking me, what do I think about vaccines? Asking me, saying, I'm not going to take a vaccine. Neither me, nor my grandchildren, nor my children. We're not going to do it. Because you're, you're putting something that is unclean into your body. I didn't advise. We've got to find out for ourselves. Children, Young children, how do they get immunity in their body? They go out and they play in the mud, don't they? And they get uh, antibodies to fight against any infections of the dirt or anything that comes into their body and they become immune, they get immunity. 
Some people would argue that. And yet some others are what we call now anti-vaxxers. And they believe something different. They believe the whole thing is a hoax and the whole thing is um, a scam. And it's been hoisted upon us. Whatever your beliefs in this, we are in a situation now that we have never been in before. And this situation has affected many aspects of the way we live and there will be no coming back from it. We are now in what has been described as the new normal. There are many things that have moved forward that won't change. We think of the statement made by Ram Emanuel, um, <clears throat> Barack Obama's chief of staff, who um, may be coming into Joe Biden's um, uh, presidency. <clears throat> and he said uh, something to the nature of, never let a serious crisis pass without using it as an opportunity to implement, implement a policy which under normal circumstances you would not have the power or the opportunity to implement. And so what things have we seen changing or beginning to change this year? One of the most interesting ones um, is that whole idea of cash. I checked um, with the McKinsey um, repa global repayments report for 2020 and it said there that 23%, only 23% of the population in this country this year have used cash. Cash in this country, the use of cash has declined by 15% this year. In wider statistics, they said that uh, the actual number of people who have started to abandon cash and use online or, or cashless payments have moved up from uh, 3.4 million in 2017 to uh, 7.4 million. Things are changing. They're changing in a way that will not return. The horse has bolted and we are now living in a new norm. And this has caused within some religious organisations, some polarisations, what should we do? Do we go along with the government? Do we not go along with the government? Some people have looked at the things that have happened this year and it has caused them to start looking into the Bible even more. And something else has happened. There are people, and I shall not name them, speakers, um, investigators, Christian champions, who we have looked at and we've, we've looked at their um, presentations online and we've um, Googled them and looked and always quoted them. And one to come up this year saying, focusing on a date that Jesus is going to come, possibly in the year 2027. And now there's a focus on this. Last year, Jesus was, there was meant to, to be changes such that we would have what they called a national Sunday law based on the book of Revelation by the summer of 2019. And here we are and it hasn't happened. What is it about these things that cause us not to learn from the lessons of the past? George Santayana once said, if we don't learn from the mistakes of the past, we will be doomed to repeat those mistakes. Is it for nothing that God allowed it so that this church, the Seventh-day Adventist church, came into existence on the basis of a mistaken date for the return of Christ. Christ was due to come in 1844 and he didn't. That was the beginning of this movement, this Sabbath keeping movement. Do you think it was by coincidence? That was a warning to tell us 
Date setting and focusing on dates is not what Jesus had left for us and advised us and guided us to do. What did Jesus say? Of that day, the return of Christ, knoweth no man, not even the Son, not even him at the time, not the angels, but only the Father in heaven. And I've heard people setting dates. I remember Harold Camping setting dates for um, uh, 2013. I've heard some of our people setting dates. Uh, uh, 2031, 2032, 2027. Whether, we, whether those people are saying they weren't setting dates or not, to get the people to focus in their minds about a date is dangerous. Why is it dangerous? Is it because it creates an 11th hour mentality. When we were kids, you remember when mum said, I'm coming in by a certain time, make sure the dishes are washed, wash. I'm coming at five o'clock, make sure the place is tidy before you, you start to play or anything and you change out of your uniform. And what did we do? We'll play right up until the last minute until we saw, saw, heard that key in the door. Then we start running around and it's too late. And you know what happened in those days. And the thing is, when we focus on a date, oh, Jesus is coming at such and such a date. Let me just party and do whatever I want to do now. And then I'll get my life right later on. Do we even know how long we have? This year, because of all that has happened, I have never known so many people die suddenly without warning as I have this year. And they haven't all been elderly people. One has been my father who died uh, and on his death certificate it said coronavirus, COVID, cause of death, COVID. I've seen people I know in, in this, people who are around the same age as me. I have one brother's last text he sent to me on, on his phone before he died. I still haven't removed it. We don't know how long we have. So we cannot focus on a date. But this year, what is it about this year? We look at religious liberty time and time again and we think, oh, it's just a term that we use. But Christians are being drawn now to actually make a stand. There was um, a girl, Kirsty Higgs, this year. She, um, all she did, she was a teacher, a supply teacher, and she mentioned something about her views <coughs> on marriage. Um, uh, on, she put it online on, on Facebook. And someone reported her uh, someone saw it and they reported her to the <coughs> school and she lost her job she appealed and she lost i don't even have to go spend time talking about the um uh the the, the bakers the macarthur's in um <coughs> uh, uh, <coughs> The MacArthur's in Ireland, in Belfast, with the, the, the cake baking and what happened to them when they were asked to bake a cake for a gay couple and it was taken to court. Eventually, they, they won their case because the uh, Christian Institute defended them. But there have been other cases. People are being drawn now to make decisions, whether they like it or not. Have you ever stopped to think? When the... A uh, Charlie Hebdo incident happened in, in France. I think it was 2017. And then we had this awful, awful incident this year where um, a teacher who made reference to it was, was beheaded. At that time, who were Charlie Hebdo? They were a, um, a, a journalist, a magazine company that, a car that made cartoons that mocked everything using their freedom of expression the law of freedom of expression, that nothing is too sacred that it can't be um, mocked and made fun of. And I, I saw some of, uh, inadvertently, I saw some of the cartoons. And that freedom of expression should extend to mocking the sacred um, icon or, or the leader of a religion. And um, when I say mocking, I mean these, 
cartoons, they were disgusting. Um, they were, you, you just wouldn't want to see them. And here's an interesting thing. Do you, I, I would say that you believe that there are some things that stand above mockery that, that should be respected and should not be mocked. You would agree that the sacred leader of a religion, your faith, your belief, should not be mocked in a way that is absolutely disgusting. You would also say that you believe, according to the Bible, that marriage should be between a man and a woman. But here's the interesting thing. Those who did the terrorist attack on the Charlie Hebdo magazine and killed all those people, they hold the same beliefs as you in those respects. If you ask those people, those um, terrorists who were religious terrorists, do they believe that marriage should be between a man and a woman? They would say yes. Do they, do they believe that the leader, the sacred leader of a religion should not be mocked? They would say yes. Do they believe that a person born uh, one gender should not have access to gender fluidity backwards and forwards and beyond hypothalamic hormone blockers and change sex because of a mere whim? They would say yes. You would say yes. So therefore, but you would draw the line saying that I would not kill someone who disagrees with me. But because they would, then in the eyes of certain people, you can be seen as the same in the sense that your views are now seen as hate crime because you believe the things in the Bible that the society has moved away from and no longer believe, then your beliefs can be seen as hate crime and are seen as hate crime today. So what about your liberty? What about your beliefs? When the society begins to look at what you believe, the interesting thing now there are certain things that are uniting society today. When we think of one, there's none more so than the environment. None more so than the environment. We've seen for many years the programmes by David Attenborough and the latest ones on Blue Planet. He has said, the Garden of Eden is no more. In other words, he's speaking about the planet. He's saying the planet is being destroyed by human activity. Greta Thunberg, this young lady who has been the voice of um, environmentalists, what has she said? She has said, our house is on fire. Again, referring to the planet. And she has said, we do not want your hope. Hope is of no use. We want your action. Now, we as Christians, we believe in hope. Yet I understand what she is saying. She is saying that hope is for the future. What is needed now is action. On that principle, we have an alliance. However, because this one thing about the environment unites the world, no matter what the belief system, the idea of the environment unites the world, that we've got to do something about it, then this can become an issue that unites the world against those who appear to be different. You see, what this year has done, this year has set a trend for those who have a different view from the main to be thought as those who put the others at risk. 
If you think about, before we look at the environment, if you think about the idea of vaccines, if you're a health worker and you're a Christian and you have uh, some view, if you're a Christian who has a view that you shouldn't have, have a vaccine. There are Christians who believe that you should, and I'm not here to decide between the two. But if you decide that you're not going to have a vaccine, then you will be seen as a threat. You're a minority, and you'll be seen as a threat to those who you're working for, or the, 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 the patients. And therefore, you will be seen as someone who is putting them at danger. If you're a Christian and you believe you're a teacher that you shouldn't be teaching um, about um, sex education, about homosexuality and the LGBTQI community to five-year-olds, when the law says you need to, you will be seen as a threat. You will be seen as someone who is uh, um, going against the development of these young children, giving them the information that they need. And you may be sidelined. If you're a doctor and you have a views based on your Christian belief about um, hypothalamic blockers, which block the hormones of children who believe their gender should be other than what it is. Therefore, the, block, the hormone blocker, you administer it, it blocks the hormone development through the teen years until they decide what they're going to be or until they have corrective surgery to change their gender in, into the other gender. If you believe that that's something that you cannot do, you will come into the spotlight. Now, the issue of the environment is the thing that, that you, it seems to unite so many people. And here's a book, a very interesting book. Um, it's a hard read in some parts, but very interesting, particularly towards the end. It's a book called A Great Controversy. Um, it's, it's by this lady, Alan White, who uh, had uh, messages that, that many believe are from God. And I think that she was... Um, a modern day prophet. But I'm not here to give reasons for that right now. But I will just say this. This is what she said regarding the environment and this issue. How on earth does the environment become an issue of religious liberty? Well, listen to this. Now, remember what Greta Thunberg said. That our house is on fire. We need to act. Um, David Attenborough said that um, we need to act. The Garden of Eden is no more. And before I I'll read you this, there is a group that has arisen recently called the, the Green Sabbath Project. It is founded by a Jewish leader called um, Jonathan Skorsk. And he has said, as you will see on our video, um, that we need, the planet needs to breathe. And people during lockdown have seen, shown some wonderful pictures, amazing pictures of cities, London, New York, um, uh, Chicago, uh, uh, Beijing, um, with smog rising so that you can hardly see the buildings. And during the lockdown, the first lockdown, you saw blue skies. It was beautiful to see. And they, they hold up the contrast. It's not just George Floyd who can't breathe. It's not just um, Eric Garner who can't breathe. Murdered by the police. The planet. The planet can't breathe. And this that use this motive, I can't breathe, and taken it from those victims of police brutality and the one who we saw this year that started that whole movement, really juvenated, rejuvenated the movement, I can't breathe, the, the murder of George Floyd. They've taken that um, a mandate, that, that, that saying and, and brought it and applied it to the planet. The planet can't breathe. 
And so this, we see, we look at the papacy now, beginning to bring religious bodies together and influencing politics. We need to bring everyone together so that we can look after the planet. The papacy is involved in the environment. Now, now um, Donald Trump is, is, is moving out. He, he, he took America out of the Paris Accord, which was to do with the environment. Uh, Joe Biden vows to bring, bring America back into the Paris Accord, which is promoting the environment. Companies like Volkswagen, who, who did things to uh, the, the, the mechanics of the car, so it gave false readings. They're being taken to court over this. You know these stories. Everyone is now beginning to look at the environment, and they say we have a certain amount of years. So listen to what is said here. It says this on page 590. Um, well, let me read the last part of page 589. In accidents and calamities by sea and land, in great conflagrations, in fierce tornadoes and terrific hailstorms, in tempests, floods and cyclones, tidal waves and earthquakes, in every place, in a thousand forms, Satan is exercising his power. He sweeps away the ripening harvest and famine and distress follows. He imparts to the air a deadly taint and thousands perish by the pestilence. These visitations are to become more and more. By the way, COVID is a pestilence. These visitations are to become more and more. Destruction will be upon both man and beast. And then the great deceiver will persuade men that those who serve God are causing these evils. The class that have provoked the displeasure of heaven will charge all their troubles upon those whose obedience to God's commands is a perpetual reproof to transgressors. Transgressors. It will be declared that men are offending God by violations of the Sunday Sabbath. Very interesting. The attention of the world turning to this group of people. How do we get to that stage? How do we get to the point where Revelation chapter 13 verses 16, 15, 16 and 17 begin to kick in? <coughs> It says, and he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or their forehead, so that uh, no one is allowed to buy or sell, save he that have the mark of the beast or the number of his name. How do we get to that stage? How You can't control. Listen, if I got a letter from the council saying, Adrian, you can no longer, um, uh, we're, we're going to, you're not allowed to buy anything. What's the first thing I'm going to do? I'm going to go to the bank, empty my account, get all my money, put it at home, put it under the bed, and I will go out to the shops with the cash and I will buy whatever I want. But if we move to a totally cashless system, then when the council write to me and say, you are not allowed to buy or sell for whatever reason, when I go to the ATM, or if you, if, you know, like Sweden, if you've got micro, an RFID microchip under the skin, when I go to access it, what will it say? Decline. If I go to another shop, decline. In other words, when cash is moved, when cash goes and it is going, our anonymity, our freedom to buy and sell goes because we are now controlled. And so we become into a situation where what we do, what we believe, affects how we shall live. And we can't sit by and wait for this to come because things are changing now. In China, they have a thing called social credit. And what is social credit? Social credit is if you believe, <clears throat> along with the government, if you promote the, the beliefs of the government, you'll get a free hotel pass. You'll get um, some points uh, for petrol. You'll get uh, maybe a holiday. If you speak out against the government, you'll be restricted in the area in which you live. You'll only be allowed to have a certain amount of petrol. 
You may not even be allowed to work. Go and look up. If you don't believe me, go and check social credit. And it's come to America as well, where people via Facebook and other um, uh, medias are being benefited by the good things that they, if the government sees they're doing good things, they get benefits. And if they're, they're taking beliefs that are different, then it's the opposite. Social credit. So we begin to see that idea where we are rewarded for our beliefs and we are punished for our beliefs. And so then if a cashless society is coming and everyone's looking at the environment and we're told here that those who do not believe certain things may be punished, this is how it can happen. I'm not here to say that this is it now. That's not what I'm here. I'm saying the trends of control have never been like this, not in, not in the Spanish flu in 1918, not in World War I in 1917, not in, in World War II in, 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 in 1934. We are in a unique situation. A few weeks ago, what are we going to do in that situation? The Bible says, Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 33 and verse 7. When I say unto the wicked, wicked man, you shall surely die if you do not change from your sins and you do not speak to warn that wicked uh, and he dies, I will hold his blood at your hand. However, if you speak to warn the wicked and he dies in his sins, you shall have delivered your soul. That's what it says. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 8, if the trumpet gives an uncertain sound, who will get ready for battle? What are we doing as a church now? This time we're under lockdown. This time things have changed. What can we do? It says um, in Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 18, it says, where there is no vision, the people perish. It says in Hosea 4 and verse 6, my people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. Now I'm speaking to you right now and I'm thinking of this girl who spoke to me. She sent me a text about four weeks ago and she said to me, I think, she's a Muslim, she said, I think that the coronavirus vaccine is the mark of the beast. I'm not even sure. I'm going to go through the Quran, but I don't even know if the mark of the beast is in there. But I said, this is an ideal opportunity for me to actually begin to explain to her what it says. Because I did say to her that the concept of the mark of the beast is not from the Quran, it's from the Bible. I said, this is an ideal opportunity for me to move into a Bible study situation with this girl. But I've been so busy. I've been doing stuff with my family. I've been doing stuff, repairing this, fixing that, helping with that. And I find today I have not done it. I have not done that study that I have been saying I would do. What does it say if Jesus says to us in Luke chapter 21? He says <coughs> in verse 34 to 36, take heed to yourselves, that your hearts do not be weighed down with surfeiting, that's the, the, the uh, uh, parting and, and drunkenness and the cares of this life and that day come upon you unawares. I have not fulfilled my obligation to open this subject up to this young lady and I have yet to do this thing. God has commissioned us to be inventive, to be creative, to be concerned for the souls of others, to use opportunities. What's it say in Isaiah 26 and verse 20? Close your doors, come in for a while until the indignation be passed. We've been under lockdown this year. We've had time to think. We've been in our houses. And now the thing is, we don't know how it's going to change, but we've had time to think. We cannot sit down. We cannot just leave things as they have been. We have a commission. 
to send this message out to the world. How are we going to do it? And it's not just about oh, how are we going to, to, to cope with it ourselves. We don't know when Jesus is going to come, but we can see how things are moving in the world at the moment. Isaiah 33 and verse 16 says, Thy bread and thy water shall be sure. I will hide you in the munitions of the rocks. We've got to, ex we've got to show that we tr we've got to ex express that trust in God. We have to trust God ourselves first. You know, we spend time, all the time, going online, looking at this video, looking at that video, sending videos to each other about end time, sending videos to each other about the things that are happening in the world. Maybe we need to just step back from that and start thinking about how we can create ways to present the message to, to people. Maybe that's what we need to start doing. I've got to find a way to speak to this young lady. I've got to think about other people other than myself. I've also got to think about my relationship with Jesus because what will get us through? Whether we live to that time or we don't, it's about our relationship with God. And I will say this, our relationship with Jesus is not on the internet. It's not online. We have got to work at that. It's us ourselves. That's what we have to do. And so I would now use this opportunity, take this time to encourage us to use the opportunity to spread God's word in different ways. There are so many things that we can do today. And some of you know more about how to do that online than I do because I'm rubbish online. But I've got to learn. We've got to do stuff. We cannot sit comfortably. This is why this church was created. We aren't just here to sit down and say, oh, we know the Sabbath. We know the health message. We've got to use it. I've known 11 people die this year. And the year isn't done yet. We've got to show our confidence in God. And we've got to show our love and our concern for others. Let that be our experience. Let us do it. It says in Isaiah chapter 52 and verse 1. It says there um, that you need to, we need to. Lift up the trumpet, spare not. In Isaiah 58 and verse 1, it says, Stand up, shake the dust off from your feet, and stand up and tell the people of my love. Amen. It is our distinct pleasure in expressing our thanks and appreciation to Agent Roberts for delivering such a powerful an inspirational message for our heroes out there our website address is www.rlot.org and if for any reason you would like to contact us then it is info at rlock.org god bless you